place. Here we go. There is no one like Jesus. And I'll tell you what, we are so happy to have you here today worshiping with us, whether this is your first time or honestly you're just part of the family. If this is your first time in the pews, you'll notice a a yellow card. and We'd love for you to just fill that out and uh, throw that in the offering plate. Or you can take that back to the uh, info counter back there and they will give you a gift. But it is really great to have each of you here today. We do have a couple things, uh, a couple announcements. Uh, One is for men. Men, there is a uh, men's breakfast next uh, Saturday morning. Uh, so you want to sign up and be a part of uh, that. Uh, and ladies, not to be left out apparently, you also have, let's see, ladies don't call it breakfast. They call it brunch. Uh, I believe it starts at the same time, so I don't get that. But anyways, uh, but it's in the, uh, I guess we don't mix them up. So they'll be in the cafe, men will be in the fireside room. You get here how you get here. Uh, and just to throw this out there, just because people have, have, have said this, yes, I wore this shirt on purpose today. Uh, so just in case you're not awake yet, I'm just saying it's there now, all right? So, uh, but it is a great day to be in the house of the Lord to, to worship him. Uh, Pastor Jerry. The psalmist says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which are set in place, what is, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Oh Lord, how majestic is your name. Let's worship him.
did that this morning, do you believe you are a child of the risen one? Let's just see that one more time. I want you to proclaim that this morning. So I just want you, if you've got it in your head, just close your eyes. Let's just sing that. I am a child of God who the sun sets free. Who the sun sets free. Sing it out to Jesus. Father's house. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. We just praise Him this morning. You are a child of God. Just praise the Lord and Savior this morning. Amen. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell him, say, I'm ready to praise even though I lost an hour of sleep. Will you turn to somebody tell him, I'm ready to praise even though I'm down one hour of sleep. So you just continue on our praise and worship this morning.
your hands together. What a powerful name we have in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right? Oh, just sing that out. What a powerful name What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. Hallelujah. What a powerful name it is. And nothing can stand against. What a powerful name What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Church, let's pray. God, we just thank you for the powerful name of Jesus. We thank you for his spirit. We thank you that in the name of Jesus, there were those that will be healed. In the name of Jesus, the, the rocks will cry out if his people don't. God, we just thank you for the name of Jesus and the power that comes with that this morning, 2,000 years later, and is still controversial all over the world because the name of Jesus invokes this power of love and of uh, mercy and of grace. And God, one day those that believe on the name of Jesus, that he's the son of God, that he's risen, and he sits with the God Almighty, God, one day we will rise again with you and we will be in heaven with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can't wait for that day. One day, church. We're going to rise again. We'll be in heaven. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when you see the face of Jesus for the first time? We're going to open up this place for worship for you this morning. You just come and get on your knees as we sing. But I can only imagine what that'll be like. Thank you. 
before we sit this morning, just give God one more round of applause, and he can just be awesome and great. You may be seated this morning. You may be seated. Stage. And I will invite the rest of us to stand for the reading of God's Word here this morning. Our reading, our reading today is from Luke chapter 23, verses 38 through 43. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you were under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. May God bless this reading of his holy word. You may be seated. Thank you, Colette. Just a little heads up for you. Uh, this coming Saturday, we have the women's brunch and the men's breakfast. And uh, at the end of those, I'm asking any of you who come to stick around. I'd like to have us have a prayer walk through the buildings, uh, through the schools, through around the new building through this sanctuary, through the classrooms, maybe out on the ball fields, maybe down in the different properties we have, just us walking and praying for the anointing of God upon the church and upon the many ministries. Uh, I really believe that this would be if someone, I had, God had spoken to me about it, and then somebody came and said, we need to do that at our church, and I thought, yeah, well, let's do that. We've done it in the past, but I think this is a great time as we begin to take on a new direction, a new vision for where we're headed as a church in many areas of ministry. And you know, prayer is the one thing that is vitally lacking in every church, but one of the areas that we really need to take a close look at because, you know, it's only through the power of prayer that things get done. So as we pray together, and let's begin with prayer this morning. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here today. We thank you that you're here because you have promised that you would be here, Jesus, where two or three are gathered in your name. We've come to lift your name up. We've come to celebrate you. And we pray, Lord God, that you will take your word and apply it to our hearts that we would have ears to hear. And Lord, there may be many people here this morning, some who have been very religious. They, they go to church or they believe and in, in they are religious in that way, but they've never had a personal relationship with you. I pray that today, just as that thief on the cross experienced a personal relationship with you, that they would experience that and live within that new relationship. Guide and direct as we seek to look into the word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week in our message series, we're in a series of messages leading up to the crucifixion or to the Easter Sunday morning. And last week when we looked into the Word of God, we, we saw that uh, the, one of the phrases that Jesus used at the cross was about forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When we look at forgiveness, forgiveness just wasn't something Jesus talked about, but it was something he lived every day. It was a life of forgiveness. And how many of you are still thankful he's in the forgiving business? Yeah. As we look at Jesus' forgiveness through the lens of the cross, we must search our hearts to see and to ask ourselves, am I a person of forgiveness? Have I truly set those who have wronged me free? Or am I still trying to gather the pound of flesh? To be like Jesus... We must forgive. Let me say that one more time. To be like Jesus, we must cultivate a life of forgiveness. As you walk through the crucifixion narrative, we see multiple verses, but the one we want to focus in on is Luke 23, 43. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. 
I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. By the way, has there ever been a sweeter phrase, sentence uttered by mankind? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I sure am looking forward to hearing either. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, or today you're going to be with me in paradise. What a great day that will be. As you walk through the crucifixion narrative, you begin to notice all the personalities and the way that Jesus, in the midst of these devastating moments of his life, took time to love in the midst of such hatred. I think it's the test of Christianity. How will you respond in the circumstances that you're thrown into, the daily struggles? How will you respond? You know, all of us face difficulties. We face circumstances that can knock us off our pins, kind of knock us down a little bit, but how will you handle those? In the midst of persecution, personal loss, brokenness, whose character will emerge? The way of the world or the way of the cross? Who will you represent? You see, we think about this incredible moment in Jesus' life when he forgives and when he reaches out in love. When we think about this incredible moment, we need to understand that character will show up only in those big moments of life if it's shown up in the little moments of life. In the little encounters that we have, do we represent Christ in them? And how do we respond to others in a Christ-like way? So today, we want to look at the two criminals. Two other men, Luke says, both criminals were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, they were crucified. They crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left who were these criminals well there's a lot of conjecture some believe they could have been uh some of barabbas's gang you remember barabbas was supposed to be executed that day and the people chose barabbas over jesus maybe maybe that's true but what we do know and that's what i want us to focus on is what scripture says and what we see from the different gospel insights is these were men two men who are guilty of real crimes these were sinners these were criminals matthew calls them rebels which is defined as robbers or plunderers or a bandit or a highwayman matthew also indicates that both men heaped insults in our luke account it talks about the one criminal one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him aren't you the messiah save yourself but the other criminal rebuked him but in Matthew's account and other accounts, we see the same thing, that they both were participating in this, it, which is intriguing to me because something happened. Something happened in the midst of this horrendous event that changed a man's life. Mark's gospel repeats basically the same thing that Matthew has said. And he calls them rebels, and he states they heaped insults on Jesus. John's gospel says here they crucified him with two others one on one side and Jesus in the middle each one on each side Luke calls them criminals evildoers I looked up these words I wanted to see what they were because I was intrigued that they would use rebels one place and criminals another place but a criminal was an evildoer a malefactor uh, a criminal one of the criminals who hung there, it said, hurled insults. I mean, he just wasn't breathing them under his breath. He was making sure these were heard. And they were pointed and aimed right at Jesus. So in summary of the Gospels, we see that these men were real criminals, rebels, malefactors. They were crucified with Jesus. They mocked him with the crowd, and they insulted him. A second thing we know about these men, and it is this. They were fulfillments of prophecy. Whenever you read the New Testament, you always need to keep one eye looking back to the Old Testament to see the fulfillment of prophecy because they interchange. They're there, and you can see them. And in Isaiah 53, 12, it says, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. 
So we see here that he, according to Isaiah, written hundreds of years before, would be numbered among the transgressors. Jesus, in talking about his crucifixion, would repeat that in Luke twenty-two thirty-seven. It is written, and he has numbered, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. So we have this fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We have this fulfillment of uh, them being real criminals. Now, secondly, what happened between these criminals? One of the criminals hung there, according to Luke, hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. He was concerned about his well-being at that point, which is understandable. Scripture, scripture intimates that both of the criminals mocked him, but then something changed in the heart of one of the criminals. Aren't you glad it did? I, I don't know if you can get much, much later in your life than this. You see, this was a providential moment for Christ and for these two men, because between them was being crucified the king of kings and lord of lords and for jesus it's another opportunity to extend grace now as i thought about this event i began to think about a couple of several things number one both of the criminals have equal access to jesus one on his right one on his left Probably not a great distance, probably equal distance there, if I would imagine, uh, of where they crucified him. Both of them could have read the inscription that Pilate had placed on Jesus' cross. This is the king of the Jews. So we have this divine moment where they're in the presence of Jesus. They have this testimony above his head. Maybe as they were pounding the nails in Jesus, laid him on a cross, maybe they're watching all this, they're reading it, they're seeing it. Both could see Jesus, heart of love and forgiveness. He didn't have to say anything, folks. He did say something, but he didn't have to say anything because if you could have seen him, I'm sure there was just this compassion and this brokenness about the lostness of mankind. Both could hear his voice of forgiveness. You know, he's there on the cross. Other people heard it. They recorded it. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. They don't know. Both could witness the reaction of nature. If you read the crucifixion account, you'll see that the sky turns black. The earth begins to shake. There's a storm comes out of nowhere, and, it, and the graves give up their dead, Scripture says. These guys may not have seen all that, but they had to see the changing of the climate and, and of the uh, natural reaction. Both could see the confused crowd. Some of the people there were openly mocking Jesus. There was another group there who probably were broken, weeping, praying, begging God, just trying to figure out what was going on here. So they have all this. One thief imitated the mockery of the religious leaders and asked Jesus to rescue him from the cross. But the other thief, he had a different idea. What changed him? What, what was the reason that he was different. I began to think about that because you think, what went on in his mind that didn't go on in the criminal's mind? What changed here? What, what did he think about that transformed this moment? Maybe it was some of these thoughts. If this is really the Christ, probably heard about him, probably because everybody was talking about Jesus. If he has a kingdom, if he saved others, then can he meet my greatest need? Can he save me? I'm not ready to die. It took courage for the thief. It took courage for the thief, this criminal, rather, to, do, to, to defy the influences around him. Just think about in your own life the peer pressure that you get on a daily basis. You youth, teens, you face it on a daily basis at school. And it's easier for people to go along to get along. When in reality, we need to stop and think about whose kingdom do we represent, the world's or Christ, and take a stance. This man had took courage. 
to respond even as cohort and crime was being crucified and wasn't getting it. It took faith for him to trust in a dying king. This isn't a king who walked through the streets with gold and glitter and horses and chariots and the mob. Well, he had had that earlier, laying palm branches, but he is not the kind of king that... And so here's the king dying, and he's putting his faith in a king that's dying. And when you consider what he had to overcome, the trust that this thief demonstrated is astounding. But we need to understand this. He was saved wholly by grace. Let me explain that. We all know Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and, or you, one of the great passages of Scripture, for by grace are you saved through faith, it's not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one could boast. This man has no opportunity to counterbalance the evil in his life. See, this runs headlong into one of the theological breakdowns of the church. And that is, there are churches out there that really promote, if you just do enough good, it'll counterbalance the evil in your life. This man didn't have that time. He's got a few seconds, maybe a few minutes, to make a decision about who he's going to trust in. And all at once, his trust is not in himself, but his trust is in Christ. He seeks God's forgiveness. And he is guaranteed a point of, sal a point of salvation through Jesus Christ. The man hoped for some kind of help in the future, but Jesus gave him forgiveness right then, right there. And he died and went with Jesus to paradise. Now, one of the things I'd like to look at is the dialogue of the penitent or the penitent dialogue. It says in Luke 23, 40 through 41, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. The word penitent is probably not a word that we use a lot in our daily routines. It is a feeling or a sorrow, a showing of sorrow and regret of having done wrong. As a noun, it represents a person who repents of their sins and their wrongdoing. So he is, or she is penitent. They're seeking God's forgiveness. The criminal came to three, what I believe, evidences of salvation. Number one is he came to a fear of God and God's judgment. Notice what he says. Don't you fear God? It had to be a convicting, regenerating moment of Christ in his life that had stopped this man dead in his tracks. As he was mocking Jesus, somewhere along the line, the light went on. All at once, things began to clear up and he began to see hope. I believe it was the power of the Holy Spirit's conviction speaking to him, opening an opportunity. In the midst of all the agony, and you've got to remember that Jesus just isn't the only one suffering there. You got a thief on each side who's going through the same thing. Now, I don't know that the thieves were beaten like Jesus because remember the, Jew, the Roman soldiers beat him to try and evoke some type of empathy. They, they just went out of control with Jesus. Probably brought on by the crowd. We don't know that these other two went through that same type of torture. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'll learn more about it when I go over there in a couple of weeks. But we do know that something happened there that moment. In the midst of the agony of his own impending death, he snapped back to clarity of thought. No mindless trailing along with the mob. See, that's part of our problem. We just get caught up and go with the flow rather than standing our ground for Christ. Scripture says he sharply rebuked the thief on the cross. He, a matter of fact, you go back to verse, it says, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't, one guy's hurling insults. It's like you'd hurl something, just one after another. And this guy, in the midst of that, begins to rebuke him. Don't you fear God, he said. Don't you fear God? If you turn over to Romans, the third chapter, I want you to put that down in your notes. Romans, the third chapter. It's well worth reading. But it's kind of a litany of, of what a sin-filled life is like. 
a life that's under the influence of sin. And I want you to notice verse 18. It says, there, for those who are under the power and the influence of sin, it says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Folks, we've got to get back to a reverence, fear of God, a holiness, an understanding of the power and awesomeness of God. You know, I, I don't want the church body running around with this heaviness that, they, they, they gotta, that you're always under the microscope and there's no, no joy in this. That's not God's plan either. But folks, we've gone way too far in the Christian community with this big buddy in the sky kind of concept. There needs to be this reverent holiness, that awesomeness of God that bows before him. Because every time you read about it in the Old Testament, when people encounter the divine or the angelic, boom, down on their faces they go. You see, we've lost that in the Christian community. We need that sense of a reverent fear of God's judgment because God holds in the balance heaven and hell. He says to those who obeyed him, to his sheep he put in his right hand, to the goats he put in the left. Luke 12, 4 through 5 says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you must fear or who you should fear. Fear him who after killing the body has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. You see, they were equally hung on the cross. The Romans could and did take their lives, but they could not touch their souls. The power of the Holy Spirit could touch this man's heart, and he did. You see, as the Holy Spirit speaks and God's truth convicts, the conviction gives way to a holy fear and a holy reverence of the divine. Now, which brings me to the second point. Out of the reverence, fear of God comes a second attribute, and that is an awareness of sinfulness. Folks, if we're using the word as world as our standard of what's right and wrong, we're in for a rude awakening. Because these people don't fear God, they don't understand God's word, they don't understand what sin is. And the consequences of sin... Luke 23, 40 through 41. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. You're under a death sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserved. One of the passages that speaks to my heart is the parable, or is the passage about the prodigal son. Do you remember this passage? The prodigal, the word prodigal means to live a lavish. Actually, I think it's the prodigal father who lavishes his love on his son. But here, they call it the prodigal son. And when you read that passage, he is out there. He's lavished in the world. He's went out and enjoyed all the things of the world, squandered his father's possessions and all that, given up his right to his family. He's gone out in the world in sin. And at one point, he comes to his senses. Listen to what it says. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Folks, I want to tell you something. I've been out in the world, and that's exactly what happens. You go out there, and what is sweet to the lips sours in the stomach. You go out there in the world, and you try the ways of the world, and you're going to come up empty-handed every time. It's an illusion. None of it lasts. The only thing that lasts is the peace of Jesus Christ. So when we, we look at God's word, we see he says, I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Notice what this young man says. I've sinned against heaven and against you, father. And he goes back. He has to make a choice. And that choice is to turn away from the things of this world and to turn directly to Christ or to the Father. And we see this as an incredible illustration. He says, I, and goes on, as he's practicing what he's going to say to his Father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his Father. And what did he find? A father waiting, longing for his son to come home. A father who, who runs and envelops him in his hug, just swallows him up in his love. That's God's will. The penitent criminal 
comes to his senses and admits he is a sinner. By the way, if you take time this week, read the Beatitudes in chapter 5 of Matthew. Only I challenge you to read it, not just in all these blessings that are coming your way, but read the chapter in, in Matthew 5 as the plan of salvation and watch it unfold right before your eyes. Notice the first verse of chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Folks, nobody's going to get saved until they come to a brokenness before God you see, we bring nothing to the cross other than an empty heart that needs filled with the love of Jesus. There is nothing we can bring to Christ other than ourselves. The penitent thief came to that point of brokenness. We're guilty. We have sinned. We deserve what we get. I want to tell you something. That's a healthy place to be when you can own your own sin and come face to face with the king of kings there must come this brokenness before god that knows they need god's mercy and grace after martin luther's death a friend found a scrap of paper in his pocket and read it it was written in latin and in german and this is what it said this is true we're all beggars we all come empty-handed before the throne of grace so when you read this this account of the penitent's thief or criminal rebel first of all he comes to a reverent fear of god secondly he comes face to face with his own sinfulness and then thirdly he puts his trust in jesus luke 23 42 but this man has done nothing wrong then he said jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom he's come full circle from a man who was heaping abuse on Jesus to a man who's just about to enter into the grace of Jesus. Now, notice his very words. He's guilty. He's a sinner. But listen to his words. First of all, he calls on Jesus. He calls on the name of Jesus. Acts 2.21 says it this way. And everyone who calls on the name of Jesus, on the name of the Lord, will be saved. So he, he calls on the name of Jesus. Secondly, he admits his need for Jesus. He says, remember, not the world, but me. It becomes very personal. This is me hanging in a balance. Remember me when you enter your kingdom. Secondly, he recognizes Jesus as truly the king of kings. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So we have this humbling nature that we have this admitting he needs Jesus, and then we have him recognizing the kingdom of Jesus. Romans 10, 13, or actually 9 through 13, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what's he promise? What? What? that was pretty good you will be amen if you believe in your heart god raised him from the, from the dead you will be saved for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved as scripture says anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame for there is no difference between a jew and a gentile the same lord is lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved notice jesus response to the criminal to the repentant criminal matter of fact we might want to say notice jesus response to his new child to his new saved child jesus answered him i tell you the truth today you will be with me in paradise <laughs> you know folks that would have been a great place to yell amen that would have been a great place to jump up and do the happy dance. Because a sinner condemned and written off by the world has come full circle to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. He did nothing to gain the grace of Jesus Christ other than to turn to God in his need. And Jesus saved him. 
in the midst of such gross indignities, horrific betrayal, Jesus, in that moment, granted him forgiveness and a new life. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. John 3.17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You all remember 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. <laughs> man's, listen to me, man's wicked agenda for Jesus could not keep him from his eternal purpose of bringing the lost to salvation. There's a lot of irony going on in this passage. Those who mocked him that day had said previously that Jesus was a threat to the Roman world. And now in their mocking of him, they say, look at him, he's so unpowerful, he can't even save himself. What an irony. They go from this threat that Jesus is to this opposite concept that he's no threat at all. This thief, this criminal, is only saved because Jesus refused to save himself. Do you ever think about that irony? If Jesus would have saved himself, this criminal would not have had a hope because there would have been no salvation. They scorned him. They ridiculed him, they mocked him, they treated him as a king in a cruel, comedic way. And yet he was the king, and he is the king. Fifty days later, Passover, Jesus is crucified. He's risen again in three days. Fifty-some days later, they celebrate Pentecost. And as Peter steps out into the arena and begins preaching the message of Jesus Christ, 3,000 people get saved that day. Some of that very crowd that was there crying, crucify him and mocking him, get saved. Later in the book of Acts, it tells us that many priests got saved. Some of those who undoubtedly had gone with the mob have an incredible turnaround. Truly, to anyone who was in the earshot of Jesus, this penitent thief defied all their reason because this thief on the cross would get to go to paradise. And in their eyes, he was totally unredeemable. But Jesus is the Savior with arms open wide to any man, woman, or child who will call on his name. Revelation 2 7 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcome, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Paradise, God's eternal kingdom. Let's stand. Father God, I just thank you that you're a great God. I thank you that you're a redemptive God, that even in the midst of what the worst thing that man could throw at you, you are a redeeming God, calling your children back to paradise. I pray that we would understand that. I pray that we would overcome some of the errant theology that's been forced upon us. You know, this easy believism. Help us to demonstrate a brokenness, to come full circle, to understand a reverent fear for you, to understand that we bring nothing. We are sinful people, and it's only through grace and our trust in you we have hope of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Love to pray with you. If you're here today and never received Christ, maybe you've been religious, you've gone to church off and on all your life, 
but you've never accepted him as your personal savior, come, I want to pray with you. We got elders, we got pastors, we want to pray with you. We want you to know the hope that this penitent thief found there that day, a hope in Jesus Christ. Come as we sing. convicted to share this last thought you see Jesus response to the two thieves was not equal one thief who called upon the name of Jesus gets saved but we don't have any record of Jesus turning the other and saying oh you can come too we don't see that there's an errant theology out there that needs to be overcome and it's overcome by the truth of God's word and the willingness of God's people to speak up and live the truth. And that is, all are gonna to go to heaven. That is not what the scripture says. Mankind, every man, woman, and child needs to make a decision. It's not taught in scripture. Rather, in scripture, we see a definite judgment, a separation of the sheep and goats. Let me read to you out of Daniel as we close. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, and he defines your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise, will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever folks i want you to understand this hell is real and the reason i know that is because jesus came and gave everything he could to buy us back from hell and he offers us salvation through his precious blood you have to choose what will you choose fathers we leave here today i thank you that you are a God who forgives even in the last moments. There's those moments where we could call on you. But today, Lord, help us to understand today is all we have. We may not have tomorrow. We may not have another hour. I don't say that to scare people. I'm saying that because it's true. Lord God, help us to turn, receive you as our personal Savior. <laughs> call on the name of the Lord while he may be found. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.